next uh, speaker in this uh, session is Carl Shuttleworth, who will be talking about alienation and authenticity within contemporary Japanese society. Thank you very much. So just a bit of a disclaimer then. So what you read, if you did read, the abstract has somewhat changed a little. So it's a lot more refined now. And so in the last conference in Brussels, I developed a concept of Buddhist authenticity. And my idea then is to can apply that, if you will, to social pathology in Japanese culture. OK, so. So it's uh, the overall sort of structure of my talk. So as I said, I'll begin by sort of talking about what Buddhist authenticity is briefly. As I've done that before, I'm not going to spend too much time laboring the point, though if anybody wants any further clarification of that, I'm happy to do so in question time. Okay. So I'll look at sociological statistics based off the Japanese mindset right, in order to determine what Japanese, the youth in particular, feel. So then I'll move on to illustrating that there's a, a sense of alienation within Japanese society, okay. and that this is brought about by so the collapse or the loss of the middle class dream. So I'll then go on to look at two responses to this. So I'll look at uh, hikikomori, which uh, means sort of withdrawal, and uh, harajuku zoku, so the particular different styles of sort of culture that emerged in uh, Harajuku of uh, cosplay and gyaru, visual kei, that sort of thing. Okay. So I'm then going to argue that neither of these approaches are sufficient as responses to alienation. And instead, I'll propose that the concept of Buddhist authenticity actually can address this. Okay. First, so what is authenticity? In Western literature, there are, it's typically divided into two approaches. So what we have is, so going back to Rousseau and Romantic philosophers, we have, it's called the social account. Okay? And on this social account, it's typically advocated that there's an individual essence. And we arrive at this through introspection. So you discover who you are. And on this social account, they state that who you are is also determined by your social context, by society. An alternative then is the existential approach. And the existentialists, they suggest, people like Sartre de Beauvoir, at least in his early work anyway, state that there's no such thing as a human essence. So it's not a matter of introspection and self-discovery, but for them instead, it's a matter of self-creation. Okay? You determine who you are, and in that way, they kind of move away from society, so they kind of withdraw and determine the meaning of their lives for themselves or what is authentic. But nevertheless, in each of these approaches, and that which is deemed authentic is that which is determined by the individual. So, Buddhist authenticity then. So, in the past, I've looked at constructed a kind of Buddhist authenticity based off. Wasuji and Nishitani, but as I was placed on the Nishitani panel, I decided to narrow that and focus on Nishitani to keep the people happy. <laughs> so, in um, Nishitani's um, religion nothingness, he addresses or raises the question of how the existentialists can look at nothingness, and he says that, so for Sartre, it's really the problem of nothingness which brings about the concept of authenticity. So because they say part of our ontological structure is nothing, and that's kind of the self-creation part, so it's up to us to determine that in very brief terms. So Nishitani then, he says, well, Sartre's wrong because what he's looking at is relative nothingness, so it's in relation to being. And Nishitani says, look, what is important is sort of this um, absolute nothingness, so whereas the existentialists, they talk about anxiety and how it's the encounter of nothingness, and that's what kind of brings about our fundamental project once we affirm that, then for Nishitani, it's the great doubt. So for him, it's becoming the doubt itself. So he kind of follows the same steps of 
um, encountering this nothingness or this anxiety, but for him, it's to become this nothingness. Right? And through this great doubt, then, you can arrive at the home ground of existence, when he talks about things as um, on this home ground, you realize that you're, or things are both what they are, but what they're not. So example, he says, like, fire burns, but does not burn itself. So here he kind of is suggesting that we're interrelated with sort of objects as well. So as Carlos mentioned about the pine tree. So it's kind of, you know the pine tree, or you experience the pine tree by sort of knowing the pine tree sort of thing. So why then use the concept of Buddhist authenticity, sort of particular for Nishitani, is that, so he encounter, um, attempts to overcome the same problem of sort of nothingness, and Sartre's response is authenticity. So I can say that Nishitani is attempting to do something similar, engaging with the problem of nothingness, but his approach is tempered or in line with Buddhist principles of no self and interrelatedness. Okay. So that's pretty much my understanding of Buddhist authenticity then. Okay. So what then are the, is the problem? I don't know, it grass very well. But I kind of looked at the public, survey, or public opinion surveys conducted by the Japanese government. So the first one on the public survey on the life of people. So it questioned whether the Japanese youth were satisfied and 79.3% of 20 year olds said no, or said yes, sorry. So they were satisfied, which is grand. So that would suggest that perhaps Japanese people are happy. But at the same time, a second survey was conducted on concerning people's lifestyles and it questioned whether people experienced anxiety. And 60% said that they did. So these statistics then seem to contradict one another. So why would people be satisfied but anxious? So there's a Japanese uh, sociologist stated that, that, okay, well, there's actually, we can explain the connection between these. <clears throat> so he says that, so uh, Usawa Masachi says that when a person has no expectations for their future, they'll claim to be satisfied. Okay. So on the other hand, when people have like a project they want to pursue or expectations will say they're not satisfied because they haven't satisfied or achieved that which they want to achieve. Okay. So we can also apply Nietzsche's concept of the last man to explain this. So Nietzsche in Thus Spoke Zarathustra criticizes what he refers to as the last man or the last men as people who they think they've reached their end or their goal and there's nothing further than that. So they've achieved all they need to. And so Nietzsche's probably referring to the Enlightenment, people, sort of advocates such as Hegel or Kant, who believed that human civilization had a natural end of achieving absolute freedom. So once we got that, that's it, fulfilled, and there's nothing beyond that. So Nietzsche then critiques these with his famous concept of the Ubermensch or Overman, by stating that man is not an end, but a bridge to be overcome. So he's stating that like, once you achieve your goal, you set something else, you don't stop, you don't put an end to it. So you can kind of see Nietzsche expressing a similar psychological sentiment as we can derive from the statistics. So then to apply this to the public opinion surveys, so we could say that people experience anxiety because they have outstanding, or they have no goal beyond that, so they're satisfied because they've achieved what they want, but they experience anxiety because they know there's nothing beyond that. Okay, okay so why do we think that Japanese people, or Japanese youths, or 20 year olds, lack expectations for the future? So Gordon Finlayson, for example, or Andrew Gordon, sorry, for example, has suggested that it's linked to the economic boom and ultimately the, the bursting of the bubble in 1991. So what we find was the development of what's often referred to as the middle class dream. Then if you go to a good school, you'll end up with a good job and live a good life. 
So that's kind of was the expectation of a lot of Japanese parents for their children. But ultimately, we have kind of, as um, Furuichi Noritoshi says, that so what had been assumed since the 1970s of the good school, the good company, the good life, all collapsed. The aftermath of the collapse of the middle class dream was that businesses were no longer to, able to offer lifetime employment. So it suggests that these Japanese youths, they kind of lack a goal because that which they kind of believed they were inheriting from their parents or that which their parents expected of them was a pathway which is just simply no longer available, something they could never actually achieve. So I'm going to look at two possible responses within sort of Japanese culture or Japanese society. Okay, so first, we're going to look at um, hikikomori as re um, representing a passive response insofar as it rejects that goal as something unable, as there's something unable to achieve. And then we'll move on to look at uh, Harajuku Zoku, and which demonstrates an, action, an active rejection of those social norms, so they kind of set new standards. Okay. So, uh, hikikomori. This term was um, first emerged in literature in 1998 by uh, Saito Tamaki in his uh, sociological study of sort of years who had withdrawn from society, and that's literally what the term means. So, I haven't got a reference here, but it refers to 80% of middle class men. So it's usually people whose families can sustain them, so allow them to live just alone in their apartment and to sit on the internet all day without going out to work. And so this has been linked to the, again, the economic collapse by Andy Furlow. So he says that um, the growth of hikikomori phenomenon is a consequence of the 1980s economic bubble and the onset of Japan's uh, recession of the 90s. So again, sort of like linking it and showing it that it's, it's a response. So in this way, we can understand it as a passive response insofar as they kind of realize that it's not achievable, but they don't attempt to do anything about it. They just accept it. They kind of... In, accept their fate in a negative sense. So in that way, it's not really an adequate response to the problem. Okay, with uh, Harajuku Zoku then, so it's going to be what I consider to be an active response in that they actually actively attempt to engage with the problem. Okay. So for those who don't know, Harajuku Zoku refers to social trends such as um, like visual K, uh, gairu, uh, cosplay, and lolita, which is typically seen on the streets of Harajuku. And it was first photographed and put into print and recognized as a phenomenon in 1997 in a popular fashion magazine, Fruits. So we can understand Harajuku then as a mecca of escapism in that it attracts disillusioned Jews who they kind of want to create their own reality, rather than, they don't withdraw in the same sense of hikikomori, but instead they kind of create their own social norms. So they're kind of attracted to these subcultures. There's lots of different types, there's like goths as well, and there's the aforementioned ones. But what you find is that the group kind of offers existential shelter, and this is something Sort of confirmed by Heidegger, he said that's one of the main sort of the notions why people are adhered to the group, because the group lives on, whereas individuals like die, you can find a, find like shelter or meaning within a collective. But the problem is, so Al uh, Alki Shoichi, who's the photographer and editor of Fruits, so he suggested that well actually. What he discovered in taking photographs over like, 25 years in Harajuku is that the dominant trend changes every two weeks. So in that sense, they can't really find meaning within the herd, within the group, because what the, the standard is is always shifting. Okay. So what we find is that they don't really find collective meaning, but this notion of individuality instead emerges. 
and that people are constantly creating new things. It's kind of fostered a, a cultural novelty. So everybody's trying to be different, everybody's trying to be unique, rather than just copying the style that went before. They're attempting to innovate. So the question then is, can individuality provide an adequate response in the sense that we find in Harajuku? And I don't think so. So this is a position which is taken up by Richard Rorty. And Rorty says that ultimately argues that individuality or individualism is the most important thing. So it's more important to be different than to be yourself. Whatever Rorty is being heavily criticized, then uh, Rahul Yegi, for example, says that someone who aims directly at originality in developing their individuality show themselves to be bound to others negatively, in that they find their individuality or their sense of who they are in a negative relation to other people by distancing yourself. So it's not about really discovering who they are, just about being different. Okay. So it's a, a negative difference, which, again, I don't think is a possible or adequate response to the social pathology of alienation. Okay, so Buddhist authenticity, and so how can this address the problem? Then the Japanese youth have been alienated by the social goals expected of them by the previous generation. So we showed that hikikomori, for example, it can't do so because although they kind of embrace their existential condition, they do so negatively. And wahari jukuzoku, so they actively sort of transform this anxiety into something else. They try to become like individuals. But this search for meaning is one which it's not about who they are, it's just about being different. So the concept of Buddhist authenticity, on the other hand, which sort of developed elsewhere and briefly mentioned at the beginning, teaches us that meaning is to be found within our relationship with others. So since the pursuit of individuality can only be achieved through negative relations, the Buddhist approach kind of counters that by saying, by suggesting that we can overcome this by becoming our relations with others. Okay. So that enables you to, to understand sort of, this lack of ego or lack of interconnectedness. Or not lack of, but of interconnectedness. Okay. So for them, arriving at the home ground of existence and the realization of one's true contents or face or that which one is on the home ground, they're able to suppress that anxiety and understand the GR relations. Thank you. Um, we have about 10 minutes for uh, questions and comments, if you have any questions for Carl. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, it was very rich. Mm -hmm. uh, but I have um, one question, or rather, um, it's, there is a certain thing that I can really agree with, mm -hmm. that um, you say Buddhist authenticity, so in the last slide you have said, Buddhist authenticity teaches the us that meaning is to be found within, within a rea relation with others. Mm. Right, but the, mm, I would say, so the, the word Buddhist is to, um, too big. I mean, yeah, I would say maybe for mm -hmm. yeah, you can you can say so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for Watuji, the social relationship is important. But the uh, Buddhist authenticity is, yeah, there are so many schools of Buddhist, and uh, um, basically, but at the at the um, root of Buddhist Buddhism, mm -hmm. so it's it's about the. Um, Get us, get us how to say the um, so getting enlightenment and uh, getting out from the um, actual world. I can say those the, the world of um, yeah, so, so society and relation with yeah other, 
others and other things and other any values. So by analyzing the I would say uh, by um, bone, uh, how to say uh, so five elements of the phenomenon. So to find the no no self, no self. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, just the uh, maybe the Buddhist the one Buddhist authenticity is maybe too wide. Hmm. That's oh, ambiguous. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So now we're trying to find something which encapsulates uh, no self and relations. Hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? You find it hmm. um, The Japanese middle class dream mm -hmm. set is or has run its course. So Mm. That's why uh, young people get alienated. Mm. Wouldn't it be easier to make the economy run again so that a Japanese the class green version 2 <laughs> is created and everything is fine? So, what I want to say is if it's, so your level of the analysis is quite disconnected to mm. the level of your solution or what you propose to be a solution. I think uh, Nishitani cuts far more, more deeper. Uh, so it's not just because Japanese middle class dream is over that uh, the notion of emptiness also big, big becomes uh, meaningful to us, hmm. has maybe the, the potentiality to provide a solution to this. I don't, I, I, I don't see the connection hmm. between your level of analysis and the level of proposed solution. Okay. Maybe you can connect this a bit closer. Hmm. So there's a couple of parts. So first to address yeah, why we yeah. <laughs> uh, just uh, so address like the different parts you said about why not have sort of like boost the economy and have the middle class stream again, because it's going to be a cycle and it's going to end again. We we'll end up with the same problem. So then we'll have a different emergence of social trends or like, emotional responses to that is sort of like, evoked through like hikikomori and sort of tribes in Harajuku. Um, no, I agree that Nishitani does like, cut a lot deeper, and I'm not suggesting that the only use of sort of this concept of Buddhist authenticity or why it was constructed is to resolve this problem. You're kind of suggesting that so, it, so the loss of the middle class dream or this notion of alienation emerging that didn't give rise to sort of Buddhist notions of uh, emptiness have always been there. Sort of the purpose of this is simply to illustrate the applicability or how we could use or the benefit of developing a Buddhist concept of authenticity. So in the, the last presentation, I constructed it. So I want to show like what we can do with it. So I don't think it's limited to this. I just want to show how it could work. And of course, there's still teething problems and things to work on, but the possibilities is what's interests me and in how we can develop it is why we workshop ideas, isn't it? So, meaning that everybody in Japanese society would have to require enlightenment, to sit and practice Sazen, and because that was the attractivity of the authenticity ideal mm. of uh, the Rome Mantics. It was widely shared an idea, mm. right? It was not just an dream of a singular individual person was a widely socially sh shared mm. ideal. I'm not sure about Shunyata. Well, I suppose the difference is in that authenticity is a phenomenon in the West, in that it was the collapse of a social hierarchy which gave rise to the possibility of this, whereas in Japan, 
I suppose like with a lot of like Western concepts, they didn't naturally arise out of like like a, a course of collapse, but were perhaps like introduced like a stowaway on a ship through the introduction of like Western sciences and ideas. So it's not going to have the same origin as the Western concept of authenticity because it's not something which arose naturally or out of necessity. But nevertheless, I think it's something which is useful as an interface between East and West, somewhere where we can communicate and understand the same ideas rather than talking across one another. So if you just introduce like Buddhism to someone who knows nothing about the East, they're just going to overlook it because it's too abstract for them. But if you can put it in terms they understand, then they're going to be much more willing to engage with it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we still have a few minutes. If there are any other questions or comments. Uh, thank you for your presentation. It was very interesting. Thank you. Uh, uh, this uh, idea of uh, your idea of this authenticity and alienation is quite fascinating. But I'm wondering if um, alienation, uh, I mean, uh, authenticity as such is or uh, all that uh, kind of a answer, uh, or not, let's say a direct answer uh, to a, a problem of alienation. Since if we think about it, it might be that uh, that uh, if, like the <coughs> what could answer answer this alienation is the sense of belong is a sense of belonging. Hmm. And in, in that in that sense, what you were talking about uh, this uh, relatedness. Uh, is, I think is very interesting, and I think that's like seems to me in like, kind of like the general level. So it's kind of maybe like uh, this idea of uh, relational authenticity or something like the uh, hmm. like uh, not like a, not so not just, not just a, a cultural specific, but like a more general uh, <coughs> idea to approach this problem of alienation. Hmm. So I kind of obviously when we think of alienation, we think of Marx. And the notion's kind of been left behind because that's often associated with sort of like an essential property. There's something which you are, which you have been alienated from, an essential part of yourself. So in a post-metaphysical age, people have kind of like swept out to the side because it just doesn't appeal to them anymore. It doesn't make sense. And one of the people I quoted there, uh, Rahul Yegi, later back will correct me in my pronunciation. But <laughs> so um, she kind of suggests that actually we can understand alienation in <clears throat> a much more liberal sense, in that, so she would perhaps conflate it with sort of notions of reification and authenticity, and it's just really a loss of like meaning or something we're striving towards and can't find. So for her, it's more of alienation from society rather than yourself, and that's kind of the, the case or the way in which I'm employing it here. Thank you. <laughs> One minute, one very short question. Um, thank you, Kyle, for the, for the presentation. You.